U.S., the rules are in place. I mean, the stuff is there. When the when the clearing and settlement was was created in the 70s in the U.S., it says right it says right in the Act of Congress that if a if a participant doesn't show up with the money or the shares at the end of the day, you can throw them out. The first time NSCC calls Goldman Sachs and says, "Get your shares in here or you're out." I guarantee you, Phil Silver will stop, and you'll never see another naked short. There'll be no use for it. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I have to plug a few quick things. First of all, my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, is now available to order. You can read some chapter previews by following the link in the description below. Our sponsors, ExpressVPN, get 35% off 12 months of ExpressVPN, and get 25% off podcast hosting with Podium. Finally, if you're watching this on YouTube, please go check out odyssey.com instead. We are hosting all our videos there. If you're a creator, you can move your videos across with one simple click and you can earn cryptocurrency simply by watching videos and use it to tip your favorite creators like myself. So please check that all out if you want to support the show. Anyway, here's the podcast. Um, okay, so uh, hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Suzanne Trimb at Trimbath, uh, Economics PhD. Suzanne, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. So uh, we're here to talk all about naked short selling and um, try and clear up some questions that I had and I'm sure many other people had about that. So uh, just to begin with, why don't you give people who don't know who you are um, a little background on yourself and how you first became aware and interested in the concept of naked short selling? Uh, yeah, I've, my whole career has been in finance. I worked in insurance and then I was at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Pacific Stock Exchange, Depository Trust Company. I even worked uh, overseas helping them to develop centralized clearing and settlement organizations post-communist Russia, for example. So my whole career has been in there. My interest in this topic really started in 1993 when a bunch of transfer agents, those are the people who keep the records of who owns the stock for the company, right? The company hires them. Uh, they approached me in 1993 while I was still at DTC and said that they were seeing overvotes. So the issuer was getting more votes at annual meetings than they had shares outstanding. And they believed that it was the stock lending, short selling and stock lending, especially stock lending at DTC, which they don't do anymore, but at that time they did, that was increasing the number of shares available to be voted beyond the number of shares that there were. So that was the first time I heard that, I mean, I knew, I knew what short selling was, I knew what stock borrow was, but I didn't really understand that connection until Carl Hagberg and a few other people explained to me what was going on. So I went to DTC, asked him about uh, making some changes to their programs to correct this, and they weren't interested at that time. Um, and I was actually had already turned in my resignation because I was going to New York University full time to get my PhD in economics. So fast forward, I don't know, uh, 10 years or so, and Wes Christian uh, knows a guy that knows a guy that knows me. And he sets up uh, just a brief meeting over a cup of coffee in New York. And he starts to explain to me the pro this problem that he sees with his for his clients, where there are more shares in circulation than those companies have issued. And as soon as he, as soon as he said that, I knew right away it was exactly this issue that they were talking about um, at, uh, at DTC in 1993. We're now in 2003, 10 years later. The value has gone from, you know, maybe 50 million to 6 billion. I mean, it just skyrocketed after 2001. So that's what really got me interested in trying to help issuers in particular, right, businesses and uh, investors to understand what was happening to them and why they were seeing this explosion of shares trading 
that went way beyond the shares issued by the company. And that's how I really got started. Um, a lot of people ask me how, how I came to write a book about all of this, because I, I worked in it from 2003. I started with West Christian right through 2008, 2009. By the time the financial crisis hit, most companies had other things to worry about than how many shares were in circulation. Um, so all of that all of that activity was actually part of contributed in many ways to the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And I wanted to explain to people how that, how, what that connection was. And so that's really how I, I got started. Like Sarah came back to it again. And every time I try to, it's like a bad penny, right? Every time I try to get rid of it, it just keeps coming back to me. So I thought I was done in 2009 and then you know, 2015 came along in 2011, and then now here we are in 2021, and and it's back again. And every time I think, okay, that's it, this is you know, this is the end of the, this is the end of what I can say and contribute. Um, but the reality is, it's not fixed yet. So that's why you have to keep going. You have to keep trying to answer questions for people. Mm. I mean, that's the something you've mentioned there is 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 kind of missed by a lot of people in this in this saga, is that it's been affecting businesses, uh, small businesses and businesses that, that, you know, could have been someone's livelihood or, or someone's life's work, uh, have, have been affected by the, the, the practice, uh, that, that, yeah, that we're seeing with, with GameStop. It's not the first one to, uh, to fall victim to it. It's, it's the, mm. the latest in a long line. Um, so, there's there's a couple of questions that I, I want to start with and, and uh, that, that I sent through that I want to try and clear up some some confusion that I've had and and that I've been unable to find anywhere else re regarding short selling. So um, as far as I understand it now, again, you can correct me, please, um, if and when I, I, I'm wrong on these. But so uh, when you're in theory when you when you short sell you're borrowing the share from someone like a mutual fund or a, someone holding the share and then you're selling it immediately in the hope you can buy it back cheaper and in the meantime you're paying interest on on that 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 borrow basically so when it's not quite okay. interest i know you, you think of it as interest on a loan but it's actually a, a borrow fee so it can be per share flat fees, dollars, it's a contract. You, have, you make a, you make a um, stock borrow, stock loan contract with the person who, ha who owns the shares. And so that the, there are some structures around, but it's, it's, more, it's more correct, it's more appropriate to say it's a stock borrow fee as opposed to a stock borrow interest. Okay, so it's like a, a one-off payment rather than something that, that sort of keeps going? And if it can't keep going, again, it's it's a contract. If you say that I lend you this stock until the first Tuesday of the month falls on the third, and then it has to be recalled, that contract, if you both agree to that and sign that contract, it's valid, right? Um, and there are some structures as far as um, how, like, industry-wide, there's kind of a general range within which certain stocks, the fee for certain stocks to be borrowed. But the reason it's a fee and what interest is that um, it's not strictly speaking based only on the value of the shares you're borrowing. It's also based on how hard is it to find shares to borrow, right? So there's this sort of difficulty factor. That's why it's not just interest based on the value of the shares you borrowed. It has other aspects to it. And that's why I say it's a, a stock borrow fee. Okay. So then when we come to, to naked short selling, um mm -hmm. the the theory that i've had explained to me at least was that um especially under reg show rules as far as i again as i'm aware is that you just have to know where a share is and then you can sort of synthetically create it and sell sell it short essentially is is how i've i mean there's it's probably more complicated than that and maybe you can help correct that but the the yeah do you want to do you want to correct that before yeah yeah yeah, let's just because this word synthetic, a lot of people are throwing that around. There, there is a synthetic borrow, a synthetic short, and synthetic share. So in finance, synthetic means something very specific. So there's um, sort of a, a synthetic short where you have, where you use options, right? You can create, you creating the risk reward 
profile, not by buying or selling the stock itself, but by buying and selling options in certain combinations. So, so there are synthetic securities. There are synthetic, and what it is, is just a way you sort of synthesize the same risk profile, risk reward profile. So that's why the word synthetic kind of, I'm like, nah, I wouldn't use that word. So, so according to Reg Show, you can, as long as you know where the shares are, right? If you have a locate, so you know someone, you know someone that will lend you the shares, who has ownership, who will lend you the shares. And you know that on the day you trade, you know that they will lend them to you for settlement two days later. So that's the locate provision in Reg Show. Reg Show had a lot of provisions. It had a lot of revisions and amendments. It's not as straightforward as it should be by any means, um, but, Yes, so you so you locate someone who can who can lend you the share for settlement, and then you do the short sell. And I think what you're coming, the next part of your question is that at some point now you don't borrow the share, right? So you have a naked short. So mm -hmm. just look at it this way: a short sell, a, a, a legitimate straight up short sell. You do the locate before you put in the sell order, right? Because yeah. you you you're not going to do that unless you know you can borrow it because you have to make delivery in two days. A naked short sell, you don't, it's not like you locate it first and then you can't find it later and you just right up front say, uh, I'm just gonna short this and I'm not gonna borrow it and I'm gonna fail with settlement, right? Oh. Very limited circumstances under which that's appropriate. I personally think there's no room for that in the marketplace the way it is, but it exists. Mm. And then there's a third piece, right? And this, this particular piece, the fail to deliver piece, is does not require that the trade be short. So it could be a long sell, right? It could be a short sell or a long sell, but you just don't have the shares for settlement. So you have a short sell where you borrow in advance and deliver those, or you locate in advance, borrow on settlement date and deliver the borrowed shares for settlement. There's a naked short sell where you're just right up front not gonna borrow it, you're just selling it short. And then there's a fail to deliver, which is a long or a short sell where there are no shares delivered at settlement. So, so those are really three pieces, three, three different activities that people tend to lump together, right? Short selling, naked short selling, and forgetting the part about fails to deliver. There's a lot of um, chatter about uh, brokers being fined for not marking a sell as short. Um, that rule about marking sell short or long has been in place for a very long time. There were in the 70s, I've t I know guys who traded on Wall Street in the 70s, they would not take a trade if it was a short sell. Why? Because they were getting borrowed shares and not the originals, right? So they don't know how many times that share has been borrowed. So this chatter about did they market short, did they mark it long? The reason that I go right to the only thing you really need to worry about are the fails to deliver is that it doesn't matter how the trade went in. If it went in as a long sell or a short sell is irrelevant because when you got to settlement, you didn't deliver it. And that's where Reg Show lacks teeth. Reg Show was supposed to be, was supposed to put an end to <clears throat> fails to deliver so that if you had, I don't know, the first time it came out, if you failed to deliver the shares on settlement date. You had you know, 13 days to show up with the shares. And if you didn't show up in 13 days, it just meant you weren't allowed to submit another short sell in that stock. So what? So submit a long sell and fail to deliver anyway, right? So there was just too many ways around it. And there was no penalty. Since that time, I remember Reg Show was uh, proposed in 2004, implemented in 2005. Since that time, depending on what market you're trading in and where your clearing organization is, you can actually incur a fine and a penalty for failing to deliver shares, stocks or bonds, right? So DTC has a fee of, I don't know, it's $2 per trade plus some, you know, um, uh, some scale of a uh, percentage of the value that's due every day that you fail to deliver. So, so there are some fees there. They really don't amount to much, um, you know, so there still are a lot of fails in the system. Also with the way the 
the way that DTC handled it or NSCC actually, let's just say DTCC, the holding company, because it's all their subsidiaries. The way they handled it was simply that if you fail to deliver shares for a trade today, that trade is resubmitted tomorrow with a new settlement date. So they don't age the fails. You have no idea how long they've been there. They're really there just one day at a time each time. Uh, so, so is there a cost to naked shorting? Not, you're right, you save the borrow fee. You also save the hassle of having the market short and you know all this other stuff, right? Um, but yeah, you, you don't pay the borrow fee, but you, you can, in, in most circumstances, you're gonna end up with um, some sort of a fine or penalty on the other side, depending on the market you're in and depending on which clearing organization you're using. Okay, now you, you're talking there about the, the failure to delivers that, that pop up and, and uh, seem to be like the, as you mentioned before we started talking, like the, the big problem that, of, of this issue that you said that the, the naked shorting wasn't as much of a problem as the failure to delivers. Um, so when, when we're seeing failure to delivers, is there ever a, like a, a mechanism or a, a way in which they are, they legitimately happen in a, in a, a market that doesn't contain people, um, either using reg show rules or to, uh, create naked shorts or just, um, making them up and writing them is do, do failure to delivers ever occur when that is not happening is basically my, my question. Uh, failures to deliver do occur without naked shorting. Yeah. Okay. So you could put in a long sale and fail to deliver. So that's why I say that the fail to deliver supersedes the naked shorting because mm. even a long sale can fail to deliver. Okay. How does that happen? Um, is that is that is the same thing happening there? Are they just long selling something you, and it doesn't exist or don't, they, they you don't? don't yeah. yeah, you don't mark the trade short. You just sell it. Two days later, you don't show up with it. You get a debit, you know, you have the, um, the, Let's, in the U.S. model, the National Securities Clearing Corporation does what they call um, novation. So they become the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer. So that, that that's how they continuously net your buys and sells all day long. You broker, I mean, the brokers buys and sells. So in that process, um, they at the end of the day, you either owe some shares of something or you are owed some shares of something. If you are owed some shares of something, then they credit your account um, at the depository trust company in the depository. If you owe but don't deliver, then they just hold that open position for you until you bring it in. The interesting thing about this, Josh, is that in the if you don't show up with your money, there is no tomorrow for you. <laughs> they make sure that they get your money. In fact, if you owe a lot of money at the end of the day, you're getting a phone call around four o'clock or 3.30 saying, hey, you've got a big chunk of money due to us this afternoon. Are you gonna, you know, you're gonna be able to pay that? And if you can't pay your money at the end of the day, the, the uh, depository can go to the Federal Reserve Bank and try and help you arrange a loan to borrow that money. The difference is with the shares is that you can't just run out and print more shares. So the Federal Reserve Bank can print more money for you all day long, but they cannot print more shares of GameStop or IBM or anything else. Only GameStop and only IBM can print those, right? They can issue mm -hmm. more shares to the public. Um, and so at the end of the day, rather than, and, you know, they just, they just carry the fail for you from day to day to day. There are, yes, there are in place uh, some fees and some fines, and some rules that say, well, you know, if you don't deliver today, then we'll give you like so many extra days. And then if you don't have a good excuse by the end of those extra days, then you only get like two more extra days. And <laughs> but they don't have a way in the US, that's crazy, right? Yeah. But they don't have a way in the US to unwind that trade. That so they say, right? Um, the, the in the EU right now has what they call the CSDR Central Securities Depository Regulations. And they, in fact, if you don't show up with the shares in however many days it is, they will reverse the trades, right? So each trade goes into the system with a marker on it that says that 
you know, this debit to Merrill Lynch's shares for GameStop is is related to, comes from the same transaction of this um, sell by Goldman Sachs, right? So that they can go back and reverse that trade, right? If you fail to deliver your shares. The US has absolutely no plans to do that at this time. And I think that this puts us at a major disadvantage because it's insane. Why would you just let that just keep rolling, just keep rolling it over and rolling it over and rolling it over? The, the, the value of the open positions and the risk that, that represents People were talking about Citadel getting a margin call from DTC. Well, you don't get a margin call, right? What you get is a call that says the money that you've put into the uh, participant fund that we will use in the event that you go belly up and owe us money is no longer sufficient to cover what we perceive to be the risk associated with the open positions in your account. So if they could do, if we could get that in the US, like then I could really retire, <laughs> then I would be done. Because the <laughs> naked shorts will still be naked shorts and, and you know all this stuff will still happen. But if you stop the fails to deliver, then there you can't, you can only, you can naked short for like a day or two and then you have to get shares to cover that. And you don't just borrow shares from somebody, you actually have to find someone willing to sell them. Yeah, yeah. And I guess this is this is kind of the mechanism that that a lot of the people in the the GameStop and and other sort of like AMC and the, the other people uh, shares that people are looking at. This is this is the thing that they are saying that eventually, so the story goes, the shorts have to cover. <laughs> but the, yeah, so this this leads us very nicely into the next question I had for you, and is what what is the mechanism here, or is there one that 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 will lead them to close their their short position like is there historical precedent for the dtccs um saying hey you need to sort this out you can't just continue to fail to deliver forever um is like how, how stress tested has this system been is there precedent here like do we ha yeah do we know what what goes on in this situation right so um if the if all of the fails had to be covered, right? If all the fails had to be covered, so that you had to go out to the marketplace and actually find someone to sell you the shares, not lend them to you, but sell them to you, so you have actual shares, mm -hmm. then you get this, you know, then the short squeeze happens, right? But as long as the fails are allowed to roll over and roll over and roll over, so if you're in this very close. A very close system of like NYSC listed stock, eligible at NSCC, eligible at DTC, like even a very close circle, then the, then it's harder to do to do what's being done, right? Once you get into over the counter and then you start going to foreign markets and you go into dark pools, then it's easier and easier to just continue rolling over the fails, right? The fails to deliver, but what they call open positions. Um, so. Is there precedent for, I, I don't even like to use the phrase, the mother of all short squeezes. <laughs> yeah. I got, I, got into, I got into some contest with some people on Twitter the other day for saying that if your only reason for buying GameStop is to, wait, is to profit from the mother, for all, mother of all short squeezes, then how are you different from the naked short sellers who really just want to drive the company to bankruptcy? Neither side is actually making a market for this security. Neither side is, is actually a market where buyers and sellers come together and agree on prices. And that as the supply rises, the price goes uh, down. And as the demand rises, the price goes up. Like that's, in order to have a short squeeze, you have to have a market that does that. And as long as that system has, allows for fails to deliver and for Rehypothecation, it's called. It's where I lend a share to you and you lend it to Merrill and Merrill lends it to Goldman and Goldman lends it back to me. Like I, there's a diagram I did something like, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago called the, the, um, uh, the, the diagram for the nuke, like how you can just keep exploding these shares by doing transactions. Of course, you re it requires collusion among brokers, which I don't know is, is happening, but if it is, 
there's certainly a way to do it where they can just keep blowing this up. Is there precedent for closing something like this out? No. I don't, I mean, I can't think of one example. The examples I know of are, for example, Lehman Brothers um, in the 2008-2009. All of the other brokers that got into financial trouble were purchased by a bank. So between the Federal Reserve, the Depository Trust Company, they were able to find buyers to sort of bail out, right? And then there was money from the U.S. government and they all got bailed out. A lot of their stuff got cleaned up. Lehman Brothers, this is just my opinion, in my opinion, Lehman Brothers had so many naked shorts in everything, in mortgage-backed securities, credit default swaps, uh, stocks and bonds, I mean, just everything. And everybody knew how bad their accounts were. That's why no one bought them and they ended up going bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. So when they went bankrupt, there were billions of dollars worth of open positions at the Foster Trust Company that took them a decade to close. Does that Whoa. say to you? A whole, like oh, a yeah, whole decade. Yeah. So, so they, they were still you? closing this, right, when Donald Trump was president? Uh, nine, eight. Uh, yeah, well, well, I don't remember. <laughs> it's a okay, but... blur. That was 2016, <laughs> 28. Yeah, pretty much. It's 2008. They went bankrupt in 08. And then, and they blamed, of course, the naked shorts for, you know, driving them into bankruptcy. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, because Trump came in 2016, so that's only eight years later. Yeah, they were still cleaning it up. So does that say to you, though, back to your question, does that say to you, oh, yes, we have a mechanism, a mechanism in place that has been stress tested and works to close these open positions? Does it sound like it? Uh, not really. <laughs> not really? I guess. Yeah, the, the the one of the it's one of the sort of really confusing and and in a way frustrating things about this is is to 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 because everyone's looking at, at different rules and how they think things might play out and how they should play out or theoretically if we worked in a fair system how they should play out and but the reality is so far removed from from yeah. what's actually happening it's it's right. so difficult to to try and get there because. And, and this actually leads us nicely on to the next thing I wanted to ask you about is that mm -hmm. one of the things I'm I'm getting, I just, I don't know what to do about it is this, like theoretically, if they are um, either using reg show rules to, to, to borrow a sh or to sort of locate a share theoretically and then um, short sell it, or um, they're just riding the short the short sales and and selling them straight off with no idea where they're going to get one that that's suggesting that there's more and more shares of the company being issued um right. and so eventually that there will be far more shares uh, in circulation that exist in the company and is there is there any way to tell who who has created these shares is there any way to look at at when in, in any in any way at all for the, the SEC or the DTCC or even your broker, uh, if you're a retail investor and say, this is a real share or this is just fake? Is there any distinction there between them that, that can be sort of looked at or is it completely opaque? So there, um, the issuer can, the issuer can figure this out. Uh, Barker Minerals, uh, it's a mineral company, junior mining company up in Canada. I worked with them uh, twice. I think we did 2010 and again in 2012, did an update for them. They actually developed something called a prolonged strategy and using information available to the issuer. Now, could DTC get it, SEC get it? I suppose if an issuer can get it, those guys can get it too. Could a broker get it? Probably not. Because on the on the issuer's records, is, you know, Merrill Lynch has this many shares in their name and Goldman Sachs has this many shares in their name. And so, you know, the, we say, we always say Macy's doesn't tell Gimbel's. I don't know what the UK version of that is, but you don't, you don't want your competitors to know how much inventory you have, what you're selling it for, et cetera, right? So that's, that's kind of personal proprietary information. But the issuer knows that. They have the record. So when you say that, um, that some process issues more shares than, right? That's not exactly true. It puts more shares in circulation. Uh, the company is the only one that can issue shares. They, in fact, know, they can know who 
So each time, let's say, let's say if two two firms inside DTC trade with each other, that doesn't re that's not reflected on the issuer's books. They just see DTC, 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 right? They see the same company. But if someone in Canada trades, uh, you know, Maryland's Canada trades with Goldman Sachs um, in the U.S., then those shares have to be moved from DTC to CDS, Canadian Depository System, right? So, so, um, so, so the issuer will see that movement. So the issuers can see also. The issuer can ask DTC, send me a list of um, who holds what shares. Like I have a million shares for CD and Co in my books. Send me a list of who those shares belong to because CD and Co doesn't own them. CD and Co is a, a nominee name, and that means that they're holding it for someone else. So, so the issuer says, "Tell me who those. Tell me who those belong to." And they can do that every day, and every day they can see shares move from Merrill to Goldman or whatever. They can also compare that to trading activity from the, from the exchanges. And through that process, they can figure out who naked shorted, who felt to deliver, et cetera. So there is a way to do this. It's not obvious. It's not straightforward. Your retail broker cannot do it. It really is information that's available to the issuers. Uh, so this idea that shares are being issued so that there's more in circulation than the company has, right, is one of the, one of the ways that the SEC was able to push aside a lot of complaints about uh, short spells and loans, right? The, those three processes have the, can, in, in fact, increase the shares in circulation so that the shares in circulation are more than the company issue. The company is, the company's the only one that issues shares, right? But when you say, you know, such and thus and that, Naked Shorts issued more shares, that's the point where the SEC says, oh no, they didn't issue shares, and so you're wrong. You were right, you just used the wrong word. What you meant to say was that they increased the number of shares in circulation, right? They're increasing the, the number of shares being traded so that that number exceeds what the company authorized and issued. That's a, it's just an important point. But it's possible to find out. It's not easy. It's not for, like, I couldn't, I couldn't find out. I know for Barker Minerals, um, and that was at the, put the two reports they were so important for what they were working on that I put those two reports at the uh, end of the uh, Naked, Short, and Greedy of the book for people to read. So you could see sort of step-by-step step how they were going about figuring out exactly who had, uh, where, who has the fails, right? Who failed to deliver shares for settlement? Because the SEC only publishes the names of all of the companies whose shares weren't delivered. So Mark Minerals, however many shares, but they don't tell you who owes the shares to the system. And so what Barker was able to do is to figure out who owes the shares to the system. And that, that was an important point. Mm. So theoretically, uh, GameStop and Ryan Cohen could know how many shares were in circulation if they so chose to. Because they, obviously there's been yeah. there's been a lot of talk about, about Ryan Cohen and GameStop and, you know, is has there been an overvote, you know, have more shares voted than exist? Do they know how many? And uh, there's been an awful lot of speculation about what they know specifically. Um, so that's interesting that they could find out, but that doesn't actually mean that they are aware of what's going on because they would have to actively seek it out. Right. So, so someone asked me, someone was tweeting to me, um, oh, uh, um, didn't you say that they would tell us? And I didn't say that they would. I said that they could and they should, but not that they would. Right. So what, what decision, how they make the decision to ignore the fact that they have a multitude of complaints coming out of Europe and the UK, especially a multitude of complaints coming out that I own shares and I'm not getting proxies. I'm not getting, I'm not able to vote my shares. All of those complaints coming out and to just say, oh, it's okay, we're accepting the vote. But this is what Overstock did in 2006. They knew that there were more shares in circulation than they issued. They knew that in fact, the CEO's own family who held shares, who owned shares, held shares at a brokerage, right? Had shares in Overstock did not get proxy materials, were unable to vote their shares. They knew that, and yet they accepted the vote. Why? Because they got the result that they wanted. So companies tend not to complain about the outcome of the vote unless it's 
an outcome they didn't want, right? They weren't happy with. Um, every vote is important. And that vote is the moment when the investors and the company can know that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get your proxy, you didn't get to vote your shares, something's wrong. In the US, we have um, favorable tax treatment for dividends. <clears throat> so kind of like the two things that shareholders get, the bondholders don't, right? Is one is a dividend, which is a share of profit from the company, and the other is the right to vote. In the US, we have favorable tax treatment for uh, indiv individual investors who receive dividends. So on a, the IRS sends you this form called a 1099. And if your 1099 says that you have non-qualified dividends, and all you had was GameStop, or like, they don't pay a dividend, but say some other stock, um, that means that your shares have been lent out, right? So that's another tip off. But the big one for the company has to be the annual meeting. If there are problems with the vote coming in, you know, and I've always referred, I've always referred people to Carl Hagberg. He has a team that work as um, uh, inspectors of elections, and they can go in and help you figure out where were your real shares, where were your overvotes, you know, who who didn't get their, you know, why why are certain investors not getting their uh, voting materials? Um, the fact that, and I, I guess from what I heard, GameStop accepted their vote and went on their merry way. I, I don't know why they did that. If I were if I were in that seat, right, that CEO seat, and I knew that people, that my investors, people who believed in my company and, and bought shares of that company to hold, were unable to vote their shares, I'd want to find out why before I accepted the results of the vote. Why is it in GameStop's best interest to do that, in your opinion? Like, why do, why, if they've got the result they want, why would they, you know, go messing with it, basically? Um, so your investors are your, are also employees, are also members of the community, sometimes they're your customers. The GameStop, I mean, that was the thing, right? They were all, they're gamers. They're they're buying products there. They want to shop at that location. They want to go to those stores. So those shareholders are also your customers. Wouldn't you want them to be happy? And why would you why would you knowingly ignore the plight that they're having with your shares, right? I, I can own your share, but I can't vote it, right? I, I, I should be receiving real dividends. I'm getting payments in lieu. Shouldn't you as, if you take investor relations seriously, I think a company would be interested in that. I, mm. I don't think it's I don't think it's proper to ignore it because the it, especially someone like GameStop where all of those investors came in to sort of rush to the rescue, right? They didn't want to see the company go bankrupt. They didn't want to see the company, you know, close down. Um, and they knew that the company was under stress because of the pandemic and all these physical locations were closed. Uh, so why wouldn't they want to to help them and take care of them? Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, that that's that, that's one of the things that, that has made this case different than a lot of um, previous examples of short selling is that um, the company has very strong fundamentals and, and unlike uh, companies like Eagle Tech uh, that, that ultimately went under, this has, has sort of had the strength to come back because people were invested in the yeah. company. You disagree? Yeah, like, Eagle, how, Eagle Tech, well, I mean, kind of like Eagle Tech had, what Eagle Tech had was an asset. They had a patent for a particular communi communication system. And that patent was very valuable. Um, they, you know, they had problems with death spiral financing, and a lot of stuff going on. And you're right, they didn't have the financial strength to stand up against it. That's why, like, if you talk with Wes Christian, he'll tell you that it's a lot of small companies that are really getting hurt by this. Um, but the reality is that the same thing happens to IBM and Apple and Microsoft and all of the others. It just, those bigger companies have, have a, a bigger capital base to pull from. They might be, they might have a line of credit with a bank plus, uh, something here, plus, I mean, plus they can go overseas to, you know, borrow money. I mean, they're not like the small, the entrepreneur who's trying to launch his company is certainly more vulnerable. Mm. Um, and so like Eagle stock, what they, that turned into a, an asset grab where they wanted to run him out of business so they could take that asset, which was the patent, uh, which in fact was taken from him. So 
Yeah, I think that 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 it's important to remember that although you know, Equal Tech, for example, um, or Taser, or some of the others are, are very you know splashy because the because of the damage done to the company, but every company has this problem. Bob Drummond, who was a reporter for Bloomberg Markets Magazine, in 2006, he did a he did an article called the Proxy Voting Charade. And he showed where the short interest was sufficient to that that one of the strategies, so the strategy for short selling legal tech is to drive the company into bankruptcy and then whatever shares you sold, that money's just yours. You don't have to give it back to the buyers, right? Mm. Um, and then free, you know, right? grab the interest. Right. Um, that I don't know. I'm not an accountant. <laughs> I don't know if it's okay. taxable or not. <laughs> It is, it is income. I think they have to recognize it as income at some point. I don't know how that part works. So you need a CPA on that. You need a chartered accountant. Um, so, so that's the strategy for short selling uh, Eagle Tech. The strategy for short selling Hewlett Packard, right, and Compaq was to get the votes. So when you borrow, when you, when you borrow shares from from a, from a real owner, you get the vote comes with that, right? Mm. With the borrowed share. And then you can lend that to someone else and then they get a vote and lend to someone they get a vote, right? So what Bob looked at, and this is just a brilliant, brilliant approach. What he found, he looked at the short interest and then he looked at the difference between the for and against uh, votes on mergers. And he found that the short interest was greater than the margin, the for against margin to approve the Hewlett-Packard compact merger. Why is that interesting? Because the Hewlett family was against it. The Packard family was against it. They're big shareholders, you can imagine. The big institutional uh, owners were against it. The pension funds who held their shares were against it, and yet it was approved. And so that's why that's why those types of, that's why you have to care about <laughs> What's, who's short selling your stock, who's borrowing it, who's naked shorting, who's failing to deliver, because that affects the votes. And that vote is an important part of corporate governance for the issuer. Mm. Okay. So uh, I hadn't planned to ask you about this, but you, you've mentioned dividends a couple of times. And I mm -hmm. had attempted to sort of raise the issue with, with Carl Hagberg. And I think he sort of vaguely misunderstood what I was trying to ask. Um, uh, essentially, there's been a lot of talk thrown around about um, some sort of uh, NFT based dividend, which is essentially uh -huh. like a it's a non fungible token. So it's a non replicable uh, thing. So you can't just go out and buy more of it. You can't just like have more money to give out if there's more shares in circulation than there should be. So uh there's yeah there's been suggestions that gamestop could use this as a way to to kind of highlight the fact that there was more shares in circulation than than there should be have you mm. seen that suggested in more serious circles or you do you consider that to be an idea that's plausible it's been suggested from I mean, back in 03 04 05 06 overstock everybody talked about it isn't there a way you know, through issue, can I issue a dividend that, you know, doesn't get to, it only gets to the people who have real shares and it can't go to the people who have fake shares. But once you give it to the depository, right? So let's say, let's say GameStop decides they want to do this NFT. Mm -hmm. So the biggest shareholder is CD and Co. So CD and Co. gets all the NFTs. Yeah. And then CD and Co., you know, pays those out, assigns those in accounts, because I'm assuming this is electronic, this isn't a physical thing, because it's also been tried with physical things, like, you know, silver coins or something. Like, what if there was some real tangible thing that couldn't be duplicated? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not like, it's not like the NFT is the first thing that, of that that's ever existed. <laughs> exactly, and the whole, you know, idea of blockchain. So you said, so what's the point of the NFT? The NFT is something that can't be duplicated, when the company issues 50 million or whatever it is, 67 million shares of common stock for their company, they have to tell the secretary of state and their, the secretary of corporations in their state how many shares that is, what's their capital structure. They have to tell the SEC that they're selling so many shares, right? So lots and lots of people know exactly how many shares are supposed to be there. 
And yet, how many shares are in circulation? 100, you know, 140% of the outstanding shares is owned by mm -hmm. institutions. Yeah. So I just don't see, so the NFT, so it all goes to DT, to CD and Co, and CD and Co gives it to Merrill and blah, blah, blah. And then Merrill is just gonna credit all of your different accounts with it, right? That's what they did with the shares. They just credited your account with the shares. So in the US, we have something called a uniform commercial code. You have 50 different states and every state had their own set of rules for doing business, right? You're, if you start a business, you have to have a license, you have to have a, a sort of insurance program, like whatever training and education you have to have to be something, a haircut, you know, a barber. So in the, she's, I don't know, probably started in the 60s, maybe even before that, the, all the states started working together to get a uniform commercial code. So there are certain rules that are the same in every state. Right. So you don't really have to try to uh, like uh, my friends in France would carry. He was a business person and he would carry like six currencies in his wallet because he was doing business in six different countries. Now, of course, he has the euro. So they try to get this uniform commercial code going uh, and they did very well. And one of the things that they did when they set up the depository, the central clearing and settlement was to create what they called an entitlement. So. The Uniform Commercial Code allows Merrill Lynch to credit your account with an entitlement to shares of GameStop, whether or not they actually have shares of GameStop to give you. What stop, what's going to stop Merrill Lynch? I, I like to pick on them. I don't know why, but uh, I would pick on them. Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs. Uh, what's going to oh, stop them from they've never done anything bad to deserve that. <laughs> right. Why, I know. So why would they... What would stop them from crediting your account with the NFT? They already credited your account with shares that don't exist, right? So they're just going to give you an entitlement to an NFT, not an actual NFT. Hmm. Right? I, so my view is the company is, has more control over this than they think they do. The proof of that is in companies like Barker, who figured out how to tell who failed to deliver and who didn't. Unfortunately, the Canadian uh, securities uh, regulators weren't interested in pursuing it. Um, here in the U.S., we've got this, you know, roll it over, roll it over, <laughs> resubmit, reprice, you know, just keeps, they just keep turning it over, putting new dates on it. Um, the UK and, uh, can't, you know, uh, you've kind of got the same problem that we do. The EU is on it. They are trying to stop this from happening so that if you don't, if you fail to deliver those shares, they're going to reverse the trade. And that means that the original money goes back to the person who paid for the shares. Um, and they are not going to let the broker fool you into thinking that you have shares in your account that don't exist. That really... Like in my view, if naked shorting is illegal and people are doing it, if selling something short and, and pretending like it was a long is illegal, there are lots of illegal things that go on every day in every city in the world, right? That's not gonna, that's not gonna stop. But what you can stop is the fails because the depository knows if you did or did not have the shares. And if you do not have the shares, you you have you you reverse the trade and if that broker continues to 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 exhibit that behavior they're out of the system so that's what the the eu right now has ready to put in place so they will suspend the broker right the broker member from functioning in the clearing and settlement system if they continue to abuse the felt to deliver mm. us the rules are in place I mean, the stuff is there when the when the clearing and settlement was was created in the 70s in the U.S. It says right it says right in the Act of Congress that if a if a participant doesn't show up with the money or the shares at the end of the day, you can throw them out. The first time, NSCC calls Goldman Sachs and says, "Get your shares in here or you're out." I guarantee you, Phil Silver will stop and you'll never see another naked short. There'll be no use for it. Okay, so then just to, 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 to kind of wrap this up then, because I know you're a busy woman. How do you, yeah. do you, have you heard any talk or movement or seen anything from the SEC or 
the US government or any kind of regulator that suggests that they are interested even in pursuing something like this that would stop the fails to deliver? Uh, has there been yeah, any mention of it at all? all? None? Not at all. In fact, they, they're just looking for more ways to manage the fails you know, put in a fine, put in a fee, uh, you know, they have these repositories where they're going to store them, they resubmit, reprice, that's all that they're doing. Because remember, what we have, and I suspect others do as well, is a self-regulatory organization. So all, all of this is happening in, you know, FINRA, at NYSE, at uh, DTCC, and they're self-regulatory organizations. So they are run by the people who are profiting from these behaviors. Why would those people want to stop it? Do we have literally the foxes in charge of the hen house? I haven't seen anything that says that they're serious about it. I look at it they, you know, they'll put the pacifier out there. So FINRA is saying, oh, we want some comments from people about, you know, what should we do differently about having people, you know, marking their trades short when they're short? That's a, that's a pacifier, right? That's, that's here. Look at this. Don't bother with all that other stuff. <laughs> it fails to deliver stuff. Don't worry about that. Just worry about this. And we'll try to do something on this. But, the, but the, those violations have been in place. I can show you examples from 50 years ago. Violations of not marking the share, uh, mark, not marking the sell short. That violation has been around since the 60s as far back as I've looked, and I'm sure you know, it's probably been around longer than that. that when is that going to stop? I mean, seriously, when will people stop committing crime? <laughs> I don't oh, know. Yeah. If only they made it illegal, then they would stop doing it. <laughs> yes. If only it was illegal. Wouldn't that be? That would, that's the thing. We'll just pass another law. We'll pass another rule. You know, we're a self-regulatory organization. We'll just pass some more regulations for ourselves. Now, I don't see anything in the U.S. The EU has this thing. It's been it was it's already been delayed since. I think it was supposed to go in in 18 or 19. It's already been delayed several times. But if they can get that through, I think that there's and and that and that start and there that momentum begins. Right. So if it starts in the EU, and it starts to spread where, you know, the broker dealers, the international broker dealers don't like having to have multiple systems to do to operate in each different country. So I think if they have to do it for the EU, they're going to end up doing it in other places too. Oops. Fingers crossed. Mm. Well, everybody write to your senator, congressman, governor, something, tell them, sort mm -hmm. this out and um, go buy Dr. Trimbath's book. Uh, I will put the, the links for um, your Twitter and book and some of your articles and anything else you want to send me in the description below for anyone that wants to check out your stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, some links. yeah, that would be lovely. Um, so thank you very much for your time. It's been a, it's You're been welcome. a pleasure. You're welcome. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter or sign up to our mailing list. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, ExpressVPN, the number one most trusted VPN. Get lightning fast connectivity with servers in 160 locations across 94 countries. Keep your browsing privacy safe with ExpressVPN and get a 35% discount on 12 months of ExpressVPN when you follow the link in the description below. Don't forget my book is now out and available to order on Amazon and on bookshop.org. That's Brexit, the Establishment Civil War, and most importantly, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.